Today, we're going to sort of uh, switch gears a little and uh, look at another modality uh, that is images and plots and diagrams and so on. So um, with that, let me go ahead and introduce the first speaker, um, uh, Dr. Sami Benjia, who's a research scientist here at Google. Over to Sami. Thank you, Amar. Is that working? Yes. Good. So uh, yesterday there was a question about um, whether we were only using uh, web documents to infer some semantic about the world. So today I'm going to show you an example of where we can actually use images to infer text semantic uh, if you have enough uh, data. Um, so let's start with the, a, simple, a simple task, or apparently simple task, which actually is difficult, uh, which is I'm given a lot of images like uh, these ones, they are actually coming from the web. And I'd like to know what they are about. Now, what they are about, it, that can be a very large uh, statement. It depends on your, our, uh, in your dictionary and how you will express what they are about. So I call that image annotation. I want to annotate each image, attach some text to each of these images. In, in, there's a related task in computer vision, which is called image classification, where usually you'll have something like 20 classes or 100 classes or some small number like that. And you'd have to say whether this image is a dog or a cat or whether it's a bicycle or, or, or a car. That's nice and there's a lot of research into that. But uh, I want to go further and try to go to a much larger type of annotation, number of labels you could uh, assign to each image. In particular, I'm going to talk about a case where we looked at with a, a, a way to annotate images from a label set of about 100,000 labels. Now, 100,000 is much more than what we usually see in the literature. In the in very, very recently, like last year, there was a competition on, on trying to label images with a dictionary of 1,000 images uh, labels. And that was already uh, much bigger than the literature. And uh, only a few months ago, there was a paper on how to label with 10,000 uh, images. And I'm going to go a bit further. And we'll see that when we go there, first, of course, the task becomes much more difficult. But, the, but you'll see that you can actually infer something more interesting in terms of the, the relation between the labels that you learn. So first, yes, sometimes size matters. And it matters in the fact that uh, it gets more and more difficult to label images when the dictionary, the number of different labels you have in your hand is bigger. So that graph says that uh, if, if we only had about uh, a few hundred uh, labels for, from which we can pick to label a given image, on average, we would make about 35% of the time we would be right. That seems low, but it's going to be worse true <laughs> as, the, <laughs> as the task. <laughs> becomes more difficult. When you have about 1,000, that was the competition, you get to about 20% accuracy. And, uh, and when you have about 10,000, well, you're about 6% accuracy. These numbers are really low. Are, that's scary. But we'll see that it's not that bad. But uh, can, we, can we improve that? And what happens here? Are we going to get to zero or negative? <laughs> so. Um, Here's the setting into which I'm going to present some results today. Uh, I've been working on two databases. One of them is public. It's called uh, ImageNet. It's actually built over another database called WordNet, which is an ontology of the world that has been built by humans. Uh, and so it's like this tree of, of uh, things like uh, humans, animals, cars, and, and it, grows, it goes into very precise semantic. Uh, and some people uh, have been putting, attaching images to each of the nodes of that tree. And, and that's ImageNet for WordNet. And the total number of images at the time we took their database was about 4 million. Uh, it now grew to about 10 million. Uh, so I, I divided these into a training set where I could actually train a model and, and some test and validation set to verify whether my model was good. The, the total number of labels in that database is about 15, 16,000, which is bigger than whatever has been published up to now. Even though that database is public and has been already for two years, it's still too big for most people to handle. Uh, 
in parallel, I've been uh, having access here to a much bigger data set. Of course, we have access to all the images on the web. Uh, I took a very tiny portion of them, but that was still about 15 million. Uh, and, uh, and these 15 million were taken actually from uh, uh, our image search engine. So people use image search, they type queries, they get images, then sometimes they click on them, and I'm going to aggregate that behavior. If many, many people type this query and click on that image, I'm going to assume that this image is about that query. And uh, of course, if you do it only once, if only one person does it, it doesn't mean anything. But if hundreds of people do that, there must be something. If everybody agrees that this image is an interesting image to click for that query, there must be something. So that's how I got that data. That means I have about 100,000 labels. That was, uh, again, a tiny data compared to what we have access to, but it's still uh, an order of magnitude bigger than the rest. And you'll see that it's already very difficult. Uh, so how do, how do we do image annotation or image classification uh, in the literature? Uh, how is this done? So there are two steps. And actually, most uh, people in the, in the computer vision literature have focused on the first step, which I call feature extraction. You, someone gives you an image. OK, that's uh, JPEG, whatever comes from your camera. Uh, what do you do with that? So you actually have to extract some relevant information from that image so that you can pass it to some model that will try to uh, classify or annotate the image. And, and uh, there are various ways to do so. The most uh, popular one in these uh, recent years has been the, the following, broadly speaking. First, you look for places in the image that are interesting. So an example of a place in the image that is not interesting is in the middle of a blue sky where nothing moves. It's blue, 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 blue. That's not interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, so there are plenty of algorithms to decide which places in the image might be interesting. Uh, then for these places, you try to represent them, so to extract something that explains what it is. You could extract, for instance, the color around that place or how the edges were. So there are plenty of techniques for doing that. Uh, once you've done that, you have a variable number of these points per image. And now you need to aggregate that into a single vector of information that will represent your image. That's the aggregation part. Uh, the most popular way to do so is to create a, a dictionary, so a, a dictionary of uh, visual features that you will create from a very, very large set of images. So you'll note, for instance, that out of uh, a million images or 10 million images, there's always this type of color and that type of color are very, very popular. So these are your uh, building blocks. Most images sh should be built using these, uh, what I call a dictionary word, but these are feature words. So for a given image now, you're just going to count how many times you've seen that color. And, uh, and this edge. And that's going to be your representation. So your representation is going to be a count of how many times I've seen that kind of feature and this kind of feature in an, in an image. And if you, if you think of it, that's very similar to the bag of word representation we talked about yesterday, where you were to count the number of times you've seen that word and this word in a sentence. That means basically that we forgot about the whole structure, like in text, and we just count how many times event happened in a given image. So that's the feature extraction part. Once this is done, you need to uh, transform that into a decision. Is this a car? And most people do this uh, in the following way. They, they will have access to a training set, so a large number of images for which they know this is a car, this is a bicycle, et cetera. That's what I call the training set. They will extract features like this for each of them. Then they will train a classifier. So you may have heard about support vector machines, for instance. That's one classifier. Uh, they will train a support vector machine for car and another one for bicycle, etc. cetera. So that, that's nice when you have 20 classes. It actually doesn't work that well when you have 100,000 classes. So that's not the way to go if you really want to scale. So here is a solution, a proposal for doing so, which actually scales much better. We call that Wasabi. Don't ask. <laughs> Uh, and here is how it works. We have images, and uh, first we're going to extract features from them exactly as I said here. No change. Uh, 
And then we'll transform these features. So these features were basically like a vector of, of information of some size, 1,000 features or 2,000 features. We're going to transform them linearly. So I'm going to map them, multiply them by a matrix that will give me another representation, a smaller, more compact representation of, say, in this case, 100 dimensional vector. So I'm going to transform this into a 100 dimensional vector. I'm going to explain later how I do that. And this is my space. I call that an embedding space. I'm going to embed the images into that space. So just multiply it by a matrix that gives me the new representation. But what's interesting into that space is that I'm also going to put each and every label into that space. So dolphin is a label. It's just the text dolphin. But I'm going to represent dolphin as a position in that space. So dolphin will be also a vector of 100 values which will be somewhere into the space. Same for Obama and Eiffel Tower and anything I have. So each and every label I have will have a position in that space. And every image that I'm given can be transformed into that space. Now, that's cool, because if I can do that, I can take any new image, put it into the space. And then into that space, I can look at the nearest label. So for instance, here I have my image dolphin. I put it into the space, and I can look what is the nearest label? Oh, it's dolphin. So I'm going to assert this image is a dolphin. That all looks good, but of course, how do I do that? I don't know where I should put my labels, and I don't know how I should transform my images into that space. That's the learning algorithm. And I'm going to, to try to learn to do that jointly. Uh, now I want to, to propose you a solution to do so, and, and I, I think the, the solution to do is to do so is actually to learn to rank. So you know that at Google, we're good at ranking. You give us a query, we rank document, and we give you the top five, 10, whatever. And hopefully, these ones are good. Well, I'm going to use the same technique, except that now the query is an image instead of being a text. And the documents that I want to rank are going to be labels instead of web documents. But otherwise, it's exactly the same problem. I, want, I have access to 100,000 labels, and you won't look at all of them. You, you have something else to do. So I'm going to show you only five of, or 10 of them, like the top five according to my feeling, according to my model. And, and either you're going to be happy or not. So I, I think our problem of image labeling is actually a problem of, of label ranking. It's the same thing. Uh, and if I can so solve that, if I can order all the labels for a given image such that the top ones are relevant for that image, I think I have solved the image labeling problem. Now, how do we do that? Well, we're going to use a very stochastic approach. I have access to this very, very large data set, 10 millions of images. Each of them may have one or two or sometimes five, but very rarely uh, correct label attached to it. So an image can have more than one label attached to it simply because, for instance, in, in the case of uh, the way I took my images for image search, the same image could have been clicked for the same for two different queries. That happens sometimes. Uh, so here is how I'm going to have I, I, I consider all my training set. I'm going to sample randomly one image from it. That's this line. Then this image is attached in my training set with some labels, one, two, three, depends. I'm going to sample one of these labels randomly. And then I'm going to sample another label. And that, that will be a random label. And it's very easy to find such random labels because only one or two are good, and 100,000 of them are wrong. So I just pick any one, and it's going to be wrong. Uh, so I sample this. And now I, I use my model. So I use this thing, I take my image, I embed it into the space, I take the correct label, I look at its position, I take the wrong label that I sample, say Eiffel Tower, I take its position, and I compute the distances. So the distance between, sorry, uh, yeah, the distance between the image and the correct label, and the distance between the image and the incorrect label. And that's uh, what I do here. If the distances are properly ordered, that is, the distance to the good label is smaller than the distance to the wrong label, then things are OK. Don't move. Fine. Actually, I want them to be not only properly ordered, but properly ordered plus some margin. So I want to be safe. 
And uh, if that happens, I don't move anything. If it doesn't happen, then I use a technique called gradient descent, which uh, can compute, impute for each parameter of my model how I should mod modify it such that next time it's going to be better. The distances will be better adapted. And if I do that very, very often, it will, the system will converge to the best local solution. Um, and I'm just going to repeat that for a while. <laughs> Usually it takes like one or two days or three days up to one week on a single machine. Now, that's interesting. It works on a single machine. I don't need the, the, the gazillion machines we have at Google. I just need one machine to do that, but a good one, <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, now, uh, so learning to rank is good. It has been used in various places, uh, not just image annotation. Uh, but sometimes that's not exactly what you want. Let me give you an example. Uh, what, what you really want, actually, is to be, to, be, to be able to rank the labels such that at the top of the ranking, so the first five you're going to show are good. You don't care how it happens, uh, what happens at, the, uh, at position 1,000 or 10,000, because nobody will ever go there. That's what happens in Google uh, search and Google image search. Never anybody goes very far after the first page. So you really want to be good at the top of the ranking. And the problem is that if I just apply this technique, uh, I'm going to end up with uh, problems such as this one. Suppose I'm given two solutions. And for the two solutions, I have an image uh, and uh, and two good labels. And in the first solution, the, the two labels are ranked position 1 and 100. And the second one, they are ranked position 50 and 52. I just made these number up. But the problem is that with the, the type of loss and method I, I described, these two solutions would actually be equal in terms of the loss, I guess. And that's not really what we humans want. We really want to prefer out of these two. We really want to prefer this one. We're OK to get rid of one label as long as one of them is well ranked. Why here, they're both already too far and we're done. Not good. So how can we do that? So the trick to do that is to wait. Uh, when we do this uh, gradient descent, is to say some triplets are more important than others. And which ones they are? They are those for which there is the, the good label is already highly ranked. And the higher rank it is, the more emphasis I'm going to put in it. And that's what this thing says. OK, I'm going to give you some numbers, and you're going to be horrified. But you'll see afterwards some examples. <laughs> so numbers are very low. Here is uh, uh, on the image net. So there was about 15 or 16,000 labels. These are different methods. I'm not going to explain all of them. But basically, uh, this would be like the state of the art techniques that people would use to classify, so not to extract features. Everybody uses the same feature extractor, just how you classify. Uh, the one versus rest would be the support vector machine approach. Uh, precision at one corresponds to classification error. How many times the first ranked image uh, label I have for an image was the correct one? So we get about 3% on the best uh, competitor. 3% of the time, I rank the correct label at the first position. So 97% of the time I missed, OK, <laughs> in case it's not clear. <laughs> uh, um, no, so uh, Wasabi is a bit better, still 96%. <laughs> now, the good point with these models is that you actually can uh, create more of them. So if you have more than one machine, you can train more than one because it's a stochastic uh, approach. When you train the second model, it's actually a different model. And you can merge them, and you get better. And, uh, and, I, and we did that. And if you do it properly, you get up to 10% on the first position. So that start to be better. Uh, so I need to explain what is precision at 10. So precision at 10, if, if you were to be given 10 labels, so the top 10 of your ranking per image, how many of them would be good divided by 10? Uh, it's divided by 10 so that uh, if there's more than one image, you never go up to more than 100%. Uh, and so the numbers are already quite bad. So that didn't change. It looks better. So that would mean that 30% of the images I have, I get one good label out of 10. That's roughly what that means. So that was on 15,000. On 100,000 label, everything is even worse. So any competitor is less than 1%. 1% 1 
we get up to three per person, so it's much better. Still looks very bad. L let's look first at numbers. So numbers only. It looked bad, but now we put these two numbers in the, in the curve and it looks much better. So the problem is still very difficult, but we've upped a bit the, 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 the quality. It's still very low. It looks very low. So I need to explain now uh, what it actually does in reality. These are numbers. Let's look at examples. Here are some examples. So one thing that's very interesting in this Wasabi embedding approach is that after I've trained, I can just look at the space, so this 100-dimensional space, and I can take one label, say Barack Obama, and I can look around what are the other labels out of the 100,000 labels I've trained. And here is what I find. So that's interesting. What I found was spelling mistakes, other ways to talk about the same person as we speak, uh, spelling mistakes. Here, David Beckham is he's a football player. Um, so you see other ways to write David Beckham. You see other football player. Now you see that we actually captured some semantic because that's very, in terms of uh, number of character they have in common, it's very small. <laughs> but it's actually the same kind of people that you would see. Why? Because both of them were in images on a soccer field and they looked very similar. Uh, same for, so Santa, you have other ways to say it in different languages. This is in French. Uh, dolphin, you have different languages, different type of, of animals that are actually uh, often seen in the same kind of conditions. Uh, same for, I don't know, iPod, you have various type of iPod to see the kind of uh, planes you, you'll see. So now, you have to understand that I've never ever said that an F-18 is a similar to an Eurofighter. The only thing I had were images and labels. That's it. And this was inferred from that setting only. Uh, I have to be fast, only five minutes. So very quickly, if we talk about the actual task, this was an image. Here is what we get. Not too bad. Not too bad. I have to go quick. This is Barack Obama. This is Eiffel Tower, something interesting. You see things like Tokyo Tower. It's actually very similar if you knew if you've ever been there, or Las Vegas Strip, they actually have an Eiffel Tower there. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> okay, uh, let me switch for the last uh, five minutes to the second uh, more uh, evolved topic. I have these 100,000 labels now. They are in this space. That's already great. Can I do better? Well, uh, I think one interesting thing we could do is organize these labels into some structure. So what is the best structure we can think of? A tree of course. Why a tree? Because if I had a tree in the label space, whenever I'm given an image, instead of having to compute the score of every of the 100,000 labels I have in my hand, I could go down the tree and say, oh, is it on the left, on the middle, or on the right? Okay, it's here. I would have actually to compute only log of the number of labels scores to decide that this image is about a car or not. Uh, so it would be very efficient. Now, such a tree doesn't exist. In some cases, like for WordNet, it is given. WordNet is a tree. That's fine, but WordNet doesn't really correspond to real life, and, and it doesn't generalize to anything else than WordNet. What happens when you, like us, we just have this collection, a huge collection of labels that are completely unstructured. You want to learn that tree. How can you do that? So here is a very simple idea. There's no way you're going to be able to separate two things that are too similar to each other if you don't have the features to do so. So if I, I don't have the features to distinguish between a, a Toyota and a Honda, well, let's not even try to. But I don't know that. So I'm going to try to, this, for an image of a Toyota, I'm going to try to, to see if, uh, how good I'm, I'm faring at asking whether it's a Honda. And, and for this, I, I call that the, the confusion matrix. I'm going to look at how many times I confused Obama with dolphin, and the number of times I confused uh, dolphin with whale, and things like that, out of my current model. I'm, gonna, I'm going to make out of my training set, or say a validation set, a lot of mistakes. It turns out that the mistakes I'm going to do most are things that are very similar to each other. That makes sense, otherwise I wouldn't make these mistakes with my training error set. So I'm going to use that hint. I'm going to try to put, to separate things that are very difficult to separate. I'm going to put them into different buckets. And there are algorithms to do so. There's something called spectral clustering that does it for you. So you can take all your label in the current model, separate into some bucket, 
then take those of a given label, separate into some bucket, and do that recursively up until you have enough levels. And you're done. Examples of what happens? Okay. These are, for instance, uh, labels that were taken from the same bucket. So you see things like uh, sharks, <laughs> sea otter, things that seem to happen in, inside sea. Here you see things that seem to be related to phones. Here you see things that are looking like uh, trucks, etc. And these uh, clustering have been done automatically using the model I just showed. Now, the good thing about that is that you, doing so, you have actually not lost any precision. You still get about the same performance, but now you have this nice tree, which could be used in various conditions, and you're faster at actually labeling one image. So that's going to conclude my presentation. So uh, image annotation as such, I think, is an interesting task. There's a lot of things we can do inside Google if we had a good image annotator, and there's a lot of things out Outside Google, you guys could do as well, like just annotate your own images. Uh, but of course, as the number of labels grows, as, as the task becomes interesting, it becomes much more difficult. So we need to, to join information because some labels are more difficult to separate than others. But it turns out that when the number of labels grows, actually the semantic space gets more fuzzy. Things are very similar. And if you make a mistake by saying uh, it's a shark instead of it's a, uh, that kind of uh, uh, and, uh, sea animal, it's not as bad as if you were saying it's a, it's a car. So, so we can use that information and we can try to learn some semantic around that. And I think that was the, the point of the paper. One thing I'd like to be able is to scale even better, but we, for that we need more parallelism, and it's not that simple in that case. Thank you. Questions? Hi, it's a very nice talk, uh, Nirmal Kashava, Draper Laboratory. Uh, my question is, why do you limit yourself to the same set of features, no matter what the search happens to be? I mean, faces will have the best kind of features, vehicles will have strong geometries, landscapes will have different kind of textures. Shouldn't you be empowering your search by using the right kind of features for the right kind of search item? Well, in, in general, you're right. Of course, we should use more specific features. But in, but, in the, but in that case, it's actually more difficult. First, when you get the image, you don't know whether it's a car or a face. So you have to extract features for all of these type of labels that will make uh, things a bit slower. Uh, but it's feasible. Uh, uh, you'll have to just to handle that. Maybe you talked about three types of features, but I have 100,000 labels. So how many types of features do I need for? really solving the large task. There's nothing that prevents you to actually have an, an Obama embedding for, uh, for using face features and an Obama embedding using car features and uh, let the best one win. <laughs> That's all. So there's nothing in, that prevents you to do that. I haven't tried. Thank you. Uh, this is Adam Fontecchio from Drexel University. Uh, I noticed that some of the answers that came up, for example, with President Obama weren't President Obama. There was other singers. There was Jay-Z in there. Yeah. Do you have a <laughs> feeling for if that is the search engine not working or if they're mislabeled images that actually would be a, pre a picture of President Obama that was mislabeled by somebody in the, in the ground truth system? And how do you make that determination? Well, so I haven't actually looked at that, but both can be true. <laughs> uh, of course, there's a... My training set is highly noisy because of the way I got it, as I told you. It's just people clicking on images. If they do that often, so if many people clicked on Jay-Z, on, on, on this image when they search for Jay-Z, then I'm going to assume that uh, this, this person is Jay-Z because I don't know anything else. <laughs> and I, I have no way to actually really look into all image labels. There's too many of them, and that's only a tiny portion of what I actually have, as I want to remind you. So uh, it's too difficult to do so. So I'm just going to rely on that. And the, but one important thing is that actually I'm sure I don't have good features like this gentleman was saying. I don't have very good face features, so I'm not that good at separating between people. So even though I had, even if I had a perfect training set, I would still make that kind of mistake. So these, the two things are, are true. Hot Lips and Cornell, I have a question about uh, what happens when you have 
a uh, label that matches two different areas of the space? How, how would your algorithm handle that? Okay, so let me give you an example like Tiger. Uh, uh, no, sorry, Jaguar. Actually, Tiger would work as well. But Jaguar, <laughs> Jaguar is a car. It's also this animal. It also happens to be a version of uh, OS uh, X Macintosh. So it has very different meanings. Uh, what happens in that case? So two things happen. First, if you only have one, so in, in the setting I showed, it will work. I, we were actually very surprised. The, the reason why it will still work is that 100 dimension is actually large enough to have one of the view being the, the animal version and the other view being the car version. Uh, but there are other ways to do so, and we tried, actually, we experimented using this trick. Instead of attributing for each label one point in the space, we're going to attribute three points in the space. Okay, it's going to be three times slower to train. Fine. We can handle that. Uh, and at the beginning, they're going to be random. Now, at training time, whenever I get an image of a Jaguar, I don't know which Jaguar it is, of course. I'm just going to pick the nearest one randomly. That's all. And I'm going to train using the nearest one. It turns out that when you do that, each of the three points will specialize to three different types of Jaguar. That, that actually works. So I haven't presented any result on that. But it does solve that problem. The problem is that when you show numbers to, like, uh, these numbers to people, the number of such images that have actually multiple meanings is tiny compared to the millions of images that only have one clear meaning. So numbers don't change. But if you look at some examples, it does work. So that's how I would solve it. I have another question if there's no. Uh, um, what, uh, in machine learning, the biggest challenge is finding the features. If you have the right features, then you can, uh, then there's lots of algorithms. How do you, so in, the, in terms of you know, the future, how, is there a way you can automate the feature detection in the first place? It's a hard problem. There are machine learning techniques to do so, like boosting is a technique that does so. So you propose a very large set of features. It has to be very large. And, and boosting is this technique that, would, that can be used to, to evaluate uh, each of these features and, and take those that are most uh, uh, important, those that better solve the problem at hand. And you can do that repetitively, and you get the top K features as much as you can. So this is one technique. There are others, but uh, in general, it's an NP-complete problem to find the right features. And it's also an art to craft them before. And uh, it's not a solved by far, not a problem. Yeah. Brent, Brent Stucker, University of Louisville. Um, just curious about the, the flip problem. What happens if you have Barack Obama at the Eiffel Tower? How, does, how do you then label that, that image? I, I don't get it. You have Barack Obama and Eiffel Tower. And These the, are two labels. In the same picture. Oh, in the same picture. Oh, sure. So that that picture, and and you are assuming that for the as a training set or as a test, as a test. Just in general, yeah. So well. in general, both. So you remember that the type of feature we have is a bag of word type of feature. So most probably for that image that have uh, uh, Barack Obama and like actually this one, I think it has Barack Obama and this. <laughs> Thing in the in the back <laughs> that you may have seen once in a while. <laughs> uh, the features that we're going to extract will extract things everywhere in the image. Some of the features will be mostly uh, representing Barack Obama, and others will be mostly representing uh, the the Eiffel Tower, say in your case. Uh, so most probably, what would happen in that case is that you're going to see in the top return labels both of them, and uh, with some probability and. The, probably here it would be mostly Barack Obama and, and some uh, others that will represent, say, Eiffel Tower. Because it's a bag of words, it, it, it will respond to both of them as much as it can. Uh, Andy Weiner from Purdue. So um, you shared some of the um, accuracies returning your research and made a, a point that they were very low. But can you give us some idea of where these precisions need to be to be uh, okay. useful, is it not? Uh, I need to tell you about the, another experiment I, I've done, which is not uh, shown here. We actually asked humans after we saw that and we were depressed. <laughs> we asked real humans the following, we did the following experiment. We showed the human uh, that image, say, and we showed them the top, I forgot, say the top five labels that we returned. 
And for each of them, we ask humans, is it a correct label or not? And uh, the result of this experiment was that uh, something like uh, between 20 and 30 percent of the labels that we returned were actually correct. So the, uh, the human perception was much higher than the numbers. The exact number, of course, it's a small scale experiment. It was not done on 20 million images, but on a few thousand images. Uh, so we have to be careful, but it's a hint that, as I said, people are more happy than the, the numbers show. So have you tried to use the autocorrect thing from, from search? Uh, uh, spelling FDHS? correction? Yeah, so I, I haven't, yeah. I've been asked already uh, that I haven't. Uh, there are reasons because um, sometimes it's uh, it's delicate. I'll give you an example. Uh, things like dolphin and dolphins uh, seem to be very similar, and it, it's a pity that we have to keep keep that into two separate uh, labels. Uh, but actually, in the U.S., dolphins also means a sports team, uh, but not elsewhere in the world. So these words we don't often, sometimes we don't really know if that was the real intent. Or if it was just, it would be easier if it was just the canonical version of the word. Uh, so because of that, we've decided not to treat them uh, in a particular way. And there might be further research to try to do so. But it's not that simple to do it. Chad Bouton from Mattel. Very nice talk. Uh, so, so you do your training initially. And you're starting now to present you know, these possible images for someone typing in a label. How are you now looking at an iterative approach where you can then refine uh, what you've done by looking at the next round and people picking from the subset that you initially present? Yeah, if, and, I, yeah, if, then, if I had a bigger second step training set, so I would need to ask humans. So I could design a, wor a game like the Louis Van Ham type of game where I would show, if you know what this is, this is a game where you, you show an image uh, say on the web, and uh, and two people at the same time try to annotate them, and and often when they agree, it's a good label. So it's a it's a game to trick people to annotate images for free. <laughs> so so you could use that kind of trick to do so. Uh, it's nice, and you could change the the settings such that they only pick into the set that I've proposed. And if more, many people use that set, then it makes sense. Uh, it's still going to be very slow to get to enough training images to, to, to have maybe enough to train. But it, it's worth considering. Right. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, uh, Oliver Williams, Microsoft Research. Um, so you, you talked about having the two functions that go into your embedding space, one yeah. that maps images, one that maps uh, labels. Um, could you say a little bit more about what form those functions yeah. are? The so they have. sure, I actually had an equation that explained that, and I decided to remove it <laughs> so that it would be simpler. But it, we use the simplest version of, of of that technique, which is a linear embedding. So suppose you have a, an image where you extract features, and it, suppose this is, you represent that as a vector x, and we're going to have a, a matrix w, uh, which is, and so x times w or x transpose times w will, will give you another vector which is the representation of that image in this space. So it's just a linear mapping from the input features, the feature that you got from the image, to the embedding space. That's one part. The second part is the uh, label representation, and that's the direct representation. So we have a single matrix where each line is the embedding, so the position in the space, of each label. And, and, uh, and the two matrices correspond to size such that they all have the, um, so in that case, 100 dimensional values. Uh, you could try much more complex version, but this was the simplest, the linear mapping, basically. It still uh, is not a convex problem, because there are two linear uh, mappings, and, and uh, there's, uh, there's more than one solution that would solve the optimal. We don't know how to solve it. And one quick follow-up. So if there is a hot topic in the news, are you finding that sometimes that's a distraction? People, they actually jump over to a different picture because it's a hot, you know, issue. Uh, and can you and can you actually use so, uh, Google knows what's hot in the news <laughs> and actually use the time information and what's. It's a good wrong. point. I haven't uh, in uh, other places uh, at Google. We we often see that, of course, when something happens, 
uh, all the queries go to that direction and then we have to react quickly. But for that experiment, I haven't taken that into account. So it might be that while I collected the data, something like that happened, and I even don't know about it. <laughs> but that's a good point. <laughs> Yeah, so this is Dan Zhao from Purdue. Then for this picture, so have you ever considered uh, whether there was a minimal order representation of the original image? So say, what well, you put down here 100 dimension. So uh, these many images, what would be the most compact representation? Have you proved? So, uh, so we played with that, of course, we, that, if that's what you mean. We've, yeah. This is a hyperparameter that we tuned. We tried uh, 20, 50, 100, 200, 400. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the more, the better, but the longer to train. So actually what we found was the best was to train multiple models of uh -huh. say 50 or 100, and then to concatenate them at the end. And that's what I presented as the best results were three models of 100, I think, uh, concatenated. So it was faster and better than a single 300 dimensional uh -huh. vector. So, so then have you theoretically started the lower bound uh, in other words, also uh, tie it together with the error. So given this accuracy requirement, what would be the minimal order to represent the original system? I don't think, it, uh, no, I haven't. I, uh, we don't know how to do so because these, this number and the performance really depends on the, on the type of data. I, I didn't say anything about that, but I, I use that similar type of model mm -hmm. with different type of objects. Mm -hmm. I tried with uh, music, and you'll hear, hear about that later this mm -hmm. afternoon. I, try, I tried with videos, I tried with text. You can put anything here. And for each of them, you get very different uh, uh, mm -hmm. hyperparameter setting and performance, of course. It really depends on the complexity of the task. It's more like a general tool mm -hmm. to put two things that are similar. They have the same semantic, but they have a different way to be expressed. Like here, it's images and, and label. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's very generic, and, and, and it's a, such a generic task that uh, there's no single solution. Uh, the, the, num the number here really depends on how difficult the task is. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Steve Johnson from SASC. Um, I was wondering, with all these labels associated with every image, that um, does that cause you to have a lot of metadata you have to carry around with the different images? And also, if because there's so much redundancy in the lists of labels that they're compressible? Okay, first, the median number of label per image is one. <laughs> so most images only have one label. Uh, and then, like everything on the web, there's this uh, exponential curve. So there's a few images that have 20 labels, but most of them have only one and then two, three. But uh, it's going to be very rare. It really depends on, indeed, on the popularity. So things like uh, Britney Spears will probably have multiple labels, which usually will correspond to multiple ways people like to call her or spell her. <laughs> uh, so, but there's not much to carry. And as of to compress labels, that's a good point. I just don't know how to do so because I don't know when two labels are actually the same thing for everyone in the world. Uh, Jim Wyland, University of Southern California. Do you take the, the intent of the photographer into account at all? Like there's a center bias phenomenon where the interesting thing will be in the center of the photo. <laughs> so in that case yeah. of Obama, will that be Obama versus the Capitol building? Because Obama is obviously the, the, so you're the, right. the photographer. And uh, there's a, so this, I, I put that into the realm of feature extraction. There's a lot of research doing uh, in, in that field. And many people, uh, one of the dominant approaches in the last uh, two, three years have been this uh, pyramid uh, technique where you actually... Uh, look at broad images and then part of the images and in, in a, such a way that it's going to concentrate on roughly the center of the image and things that are around. So you can craft your features such that you put more attention in the center or as, uh, wherever you want, actually. And that works better. So I haven't done that in that experiment, uh, I think. <laughs> but it's, it's in the feature extraction part, so it's not in the modeling part. So you, these two IDs could be joined without any problem. All right, let's thank the speaker once again.